um, about being recorded, please private message me, but I will make the recording available as well. So um, please take it away, Maruth. Thank you so much, Belinda. Again, uh, Maruth Figueroa, and I serve as the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Student Retention and Success. And on behalf of UC San Diego leadership, it is my honor to welcome you. Um, and first, I'd really like to thank each and every one of you for your continued support in strengthening the pipeline to UC San Diego and helping our students be successful. And I also want to take this opportunity um, really briefly to share with you the various other programs with, uh, within SRS that can support their transition and success to our university. Um, I know that you're familiar with CAS, you'll get more information about CAS, but just wanted to briefly share the mission of SRS or Student Retention and Success is really to provide the leadership and enhance the services that foster student, faculty, and staff collaboration to advance the success of every and each student that comes through our campus. Um, our vision is really to eliminate obstacles and to improve the pathways for success, not only in academic, personal, and also professionally for our students. Um, and then finally, um, to share with you that SRS is grounded in, in theory and our collective programs are distinct, strength-based and identity conscious, recognizing that students who attend our campus um, with lived experiences are different and varied in nature. And so we offer a variety of support programs and services. And I invite you, I'll drop in the chat, the link to SRS so that you can also learn about the various different programs. And hopefully you can engage with, um, with us during Triton Day and Triton Transfer Day as well, where many of our units will be. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it back over to Belinda. Thank you, Dr. Figueroa. Um, and we, Shane Sadler, um, who is the Director of Admissions, will share some admissions information. And again, we will make these slides available to you all here. All right, so everyone can see my screen, but you can't see my face, which is probably a blessing. Um, so just again, just introducing myself, Shane Salad, Director of Undergraduate Admissions. Uh, you've heard also that there are two other admissions officers here and representatives, uh, Debbie and Roberta. Uh, they're also joining me today to, uh, as they work very, very closely uh, with CASP. Uh, so today what I plan on covering in my short time is the application data, the admissions process, uh, the differences, differences and similarities uh, for this year's class, also standardized testing considerations and how that has changed within our process. And then also uh, an opportunity uh, to, to, to talk about data sharing and um, information around that. So let's make sure I advance my slide. All right, so here you can see in this slide overall, uh, we are number two in the system, that is the UC system regarding total number of applications received, more than 140,000 applications. Uh, this is a tremendous growth over what we had last year. We received uh, about 18, over 18% 18 uh, growth in our applications and that total number was 18,000 plus more applications than we did last year. We saw an increase within those applications, an increase in our California resident applications, a 15.1% increase in that area. And in our domestic applications and our international applications, we also saw growth, domestic growth, almost 45% and international applications up 10%. The reason why I wanna share this, the growth, not just in California or regionally or locally, is because as we review our applications, we do review them in a holistic review process. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, but with the volume of applications increases, uh, a word that a lot of people uh, use, not afraid to use here, is the competition uh, within the process. Uh, we, didn't, we don't have more seats available, meaning we don't say, well, we got more apps, so we're gonna increase the number of students we enroll. Uh, actually, the number of students that we enroll is pretty much uh, similar to what it has been historically. And so the volume of applications increases the level of selectivity and uh, the word again, competition. So I mentioned a holistic review process. And so as you know, the UC San Diego seeks to enroll students who represent strong academic achievements, exceptional personal talents, and a broad diversity of abilities. 
a person, their personal experiences and backgrounds are really important as we review uh, our students in this process. It is important that our students be prepared to meet faculty demands and excel in our challenging academic environment, as well as become active members of the larger campus community. So within a holistic review process, we're looking at not just the academic preparation, but also the non-academic areas in which a student represents and presents with, within their application. We are one of the most selective university, universities, not just in the UCs, but also in the country. And so again, it is very competitive. So within this process, our reviewers, our application readers thoughtfully consider the full spectrum of an applicant's qualifications based on the evidence in the application. So if, if a word of, I guess, instruction or wisdom or thought, uh, as you all work with such fantastic students uh, within your schools and the communities in which you represent today, uh, it is important for students to recognize and realize that when we review the application, we can only base our decision or our review on what they present in the application. So I would suggest, again, as, as I've shared with my own students, in my own as a former high school teacher uh, and as a parent uh, with my kids that have, are in college or graduated from college, that spending time on the application is important to not rush it, to make sure that what's in the application is a true representation of themselves both as, as, as people uh, and as in, which is includes their academic and their interest as well. So we review these applications within the context of an applicant's environment and personal circumstances uh, as well as the, looking at this, the, them in a overall review of the entire applicant pool. The review incorporates those traditional quantitative measures, such as academic achievement, GPA, uh, extracurricular activities, leadership, community involvement, enrichment programs, et cetera. Know this, that uh, within this, uh, the spectrum of the review process within the UC system or with all, in all the state of California, that the use of race or gender or ethnicity is not a factor that is used and considered or considered in the admissions process. There is a lot of similarities, uh, pretty much everything that a student applied two years ago, three years ago, uh, to this year is very, very similar, not the same, minus standardized testing. So uh, should I dare go into where we, where we were a year ago today or about roughly a year ago when this pandemic started? And, and with the pandemic, a lot of discussions began to happen uh, or to, to reappear uh, when it came to standardized testing. Uh, ultimately, the UC system decided that uh, testing, standardized testing would not be part of the review process. And so this year in our review process, we're looking at all things, again, the holistic review, but minus the test. So as you've worked with your students and then you continue to work with your students, I would say that really what uh, on the academic um, side of the application, it's really a couple of things that you should always consider and have always considered when discussing with your students. Academic rigor, uh, academic preparation, meaning the courses and the classes that they've chosen or allowed to take. Uh, and within those choices, their performance in those classes. You know, I think it's important also to recognize that uh, that not every student has the same opportunities um, across the board. Some schools offer uh, more APs or IBs or honors classes than other schools and other school districts. And so we look at the students and evaluate them within the opportunities that they're available to, uh, to access within their community, within their school. So it's not this school versus this school or that school. It's really how did you do within your own school, within your community, again, within the, within the opportunities that were avoided or uh, uh, allowed or shared for you. I think the other thing too, uh, beyond the academic is the non-academic. And I mentioned uh, leadership or involvement in, in extracurricular activities. I think, you know, again, the pandemic is real, right? And students that could play uh, in the marching band can no longer play in the marching band. 
um, that could be on the baseball team or softball team or volleyball team could no longer be in some of those activities. And so we understand and saw that and see that as we are reviewing applications at this time, that leadership opportunities uh, have been disrupted by many, by for, for nearly everyone. And so it's important uh, that, uh, again, that we, as you advise, continue to advise students that it's the, the place to share, again, their, their full story is in their personal insight questions, their short answer essays that we read when we're reviewing a student's application. A lot of things, again, on this slide, just, just talking about our apps and where we fit and where we are uh, within just not the full realm of applications that are submitted to our campus, but also how that process looks for our campus so that as you're working with the students, you could advise and share with them properly. Um, let's can go to the next slide here. Uh, and I'll wrap up really quick because I know we're uh, on a clock. And I, I tend to and have been accused of over talking and uh, so I won't do that to you all today. Uh, the academic portion of this, and this again, slides that we'll be sharing. Uh, we, have, we offer uh, 140 plus majors across eight discipline areas. Uh, we offer wonderful opportunities in all areas, including the arts and humanities. We're top five college drama program in the world. Uh, we're home to the La Jolla Playhouse. Students that want to apply in the arts are invited to submit an optional portfolio. Um, and I think what's important here is I'm sharing and thinking through this slide and talking to you about it is that we know that in that going back that volume of applications that we receive, that many of your students apply to UC San Diego, but many of your students also apply to other schools within the UC system. Uh, other schools outside of the UC system, community colleges, other colleges within the country. Um, and I, my hope uh, for not just our students, which is build community, but that was my word. My hope for you all is as you are uh, counseling students about their college application process and the college decision, that they do and you do uh, encourage them to say UC San Diego is not just that school in your community, not just that school uh, up there or over there uh, in La Jolla, but a school that will offer in, uh, uh, them opportunities uh, and experiences, and I'm biased, that no other school in the country can offer them. Um, and so we're here and I'm here today to just say to you all, uh, we're not just any school. Uh, we're a great school, uh, one of the best in many areas uh, across our academic disciplines, but also as a great community for students to come, explore, grow, and then go out into the world and the communities uh, to which they will serve and live and provide opportunities uh, for others uh, that they come into contact with. So really quick, again, just almost wrap it up here. So this slide gives you a snapshot of the campus and our undergraduate student profile. We're not a small school. We're not a mid-sized school. We are a large school, a tier one research institution with over 30,000 undergraduate students. Every year, uh, two thirds of our students enter as first year students, uh, meaning a third of our students enter as transfer students, which is primarily, uh, those transfer students primarily come from California community colleges. Our students come from uh, 45 US states and over 100 countries throughout the world. Uh, it is, we know that three fourths of all of our undergraduates are from California. Our first year snapshot. So one of the things that you'll look at, and this is for our entering class of last year, uh, where we received over 100,000 applications with 38,000, 38% 38 uh, 38 of those students, 38,000 were admitted. Uh, you can see the statistics around what that uh, medium GPA, uh, median test score, know that those uh, test scores will and next year will not be there because as this year, you know, we are test blind, meaning we do not review or see test scores at all during the uh, admissions process. So, and I can skip that one and I will save uh, you all and we'll say we can answer questions at the end of the presentations. So that is my quick update. Thank you, Lee Shane. And Mr. Ballard, we did see your question in the chat. So we'll make sure to get it answered um, oh, one of the, through the chat after. 
sorry, one of the things that I failed to, to, uh, to, to respond to our answer was, I know that there was questions around data and data sharing. How many kids from my school got admitted? How many kids from you know, the community got admitted? So I'm gonna insert, uh, as soon as I shut up, I'm gonna insert a link uh, to UCLP where you can see uh, by school, how many kids were admitted, how many kids, well, not just admitted, applied, admitted, and then accepted the offer to attend UC San Diego. Unfortunately, we are not able to share directly names of the students. Uh, so I can give you some advice later on how to get that information. But for now, I'll put into the chat. There it is right there. Thanks, Roberta. Uh, the chat where you could look at uh, your school and see how many kids applied, admitted, and then accepted. Thank you, Shane. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Artur Rangel. I am the lead residence deputy on campus. And my job is to determine if a student is classified as a resident or non-resident for tuition purposes. Um, one of the things that um, is different is there's different regulations that govern residency in terms of admissions. And then once you uh, accept it to the university, as you can see in the slide, um, students under 24 is derived from their parents or where their parents are physically living. Um, for CAS, for these students that come on campus and are accepted, um, they have to be classified either a resident or a non resident with an AB 540 exemption to qualify for the scholarship. Um, so again, for resident, it's students under 24 is derived from where their parents live. Um, in case they, the, uh, what they call the parents don't um, live here, if a student attended high school in California for three years, they qualify for an exemption, meaning they still pay in-state tuition, and that works. These are the two scenarios that we usually see for these students, either they came to high school for three to four years, or they went, uh, what's it called? They attended two years of high school and one year of elementary or middle school. That's how they would qualify for AP 540. Um, all these students fill out their forms through the UC San Diego applicant portal. Um, and as you can see, there's the website and they all should have got an email and been able to go in and fill it out. Um, once they fill out the forms, um, they are either going to be classified as a resident automatically or they're going to be asked for to submit documentation. Um, but the other thing is, um, another thing is that um, if they have questions, they could email us at residentdeputy at ucsd.edu. Or if you guys have questions or you're helping students, because counselors do reach out to me directly, my email is a5rangel at ucsd.edu. So if any students have questions or concerns, because we do ask a lot of questions on where the parents live, immigration status, and things like that. So that's, that's what we, we usually do. Um, and, that's, and it's very important that they fill out these forms because if they're not, they need to be classified as a resident or non-resident with AB 542 to um, be able to receive the scholarship. Uh, and then if you have any questions, again, email me um, and I'll be glad to help anybody out. Thank you so much, Arturo. And Esteban, you're up. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Melinda? Okay, very good. Yes. Right. So well, welcome, everybody. Um, once again, Esteban Marquez, Associate Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. And uh, we'll be going and talking about the overview of, of financial aid um, here. So what is our purpose? So we, we do try to ensure that all admitted students have adequate resources to attend UC San Diego. Um, we do award uh, every year uh, over $400 million to undergraduates in combination of grants, in student loans and work study. Um, so that is our goal to uh, make sure that the student is able to uh, attend UC San Diego and be able to pay for their, their student expenses. Um, and what, what do we look at? So we do look at, um, students should have already uh, completed this for fall of, of 2021. Um, so the FAFSA or the California Dream Act is the application we look at um, to determine a student's financial aid eligibility. Um, deadline has been March 2nd for years and it will continue to be uh, for the short term as well. So as a student that applies for financial aid, 
either using the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application is students that we will review and calculate their financial aid eligibility. And if it's done correctly, we do that and post that to their um, uh, admission information so they can uh, look at their estimated financial aid before they make the decision of what university to attend. And we hope that, that they choose UC San Diego, of course. Um, and the important thing is not to do both. Um, there's some students that for some reason do both. You either do the FAFSA if you're a US citizen or permanent resident, um, or if uh, you're AB 540 eligible, as uh, Arturo had mentioned before, uh, you're undocumented, then you do the DREAM Act application. So you do one or the other. Um, very important that the information is accurate. Um, for the FAFSA filers, we, we look at the social security number, uh, date of birth, and the student name to match with uh, our information. Um, so it's important that you fill that information out accurately or the student fills it out accurately for us to quickly uh, and accurately award financial aid uh, to the student. Okay. All right, so once the student fills out, or family fills out the FAFSA or California Dream Act, they give us some information and it's called the expected family contribution. Um, and it's the amount that a family can reasonably uh, be expected to contribute over the course of the school year. Um, and it's used throughout the uh, United States uh, as a comparison between one family and the other, and it's used by financial aid office to do the calculation for financial aid. Um, there are two components to it, which is the parent and the student contribution. Um, the primary factors are the income of the parent and student, um, the asset information, the amount of family members, and the amount of family members that are attending college. Those are the, the core um, uh, criteria that is used in the calculation for what's called the expected family contribution. Okay, so now we, for us to do our calculation, we also have to look at the college costs. costs. So here uh, is an uh, estimate of what a, a undergrad student um, that is a resident and is living on campus, what their expenses will be. Um, as you can see, the, the big part of their expenses are the tuition and fees and the room and board if they were to live on campus. Um, important note is that of UC San Diego students, um, approximately 60% of our students pay no tuition fees. They have either grant money um, or scholarships or waivers or our student veterans um, have the GI Bill that pay off their, their tuition and fees. So of the 30,000 plus undergraduates, um, a large portion of those students right off the bat do not pay um, their tuition and fees because they have assistance that they'll take care of that free money. They'll take care of that. Um, there's also the room and board is the other part of the costs, um, college costs. And uh, we do have uh, loans, work study and grant as well to help pay for, for the room and board um, for students that is living on campus. Um, important to note though, um, we do look at a weighted average. So this 15,336 for student living on campus, it's a weighted average. Um, you just want to uh, guide your students. Um, if they choose a single dorm, if, if live in the single, then their costs may be higher than what, what is shown here. So um, you can also have uh, double and triple occupancy in, in the dorms. So as you go on up from one, two and three, your, your costs will be less. Uh, so it's great to have a single, but just be aware uh, it will be uh, cost me a little bit more um, in that situation. Okay, so now this is our, our formula we use. We take the estimated cost of attendance. We take the information from the FAFSA or the California Dream Act, and we have what's called the financial need. And that is our target to award grants um, and also uh, loans and work study. And this is just the sources of um, financial aid. So you may have heard of the federal Pell Grant, which is approximately 6,500 this year. Uh, so that's money that comes from the federal government. Uh, the state grant called the Cal Grant, it's uh, over $12,000 of uh, a grant that can be awarded to a student. Um, our money, uh, the UC San Diego has resources. So we 
award um, a minimum of $200 up to approximately $26,000. So it depends on the student's uh, situation based on the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. And then private agencies, many of our entering students bring in um, scholarships um, outside of the university uh, that helps pay for their college costs. Okay, you may have heard of the Blue and Gold Opportunity Plan. Um, so what this is, is that if a student is a California resident, total family income is less than 80,000 based on the FAFSA or the California Dream Act, and they apply on time, um, they will be guaranteed that their tuition and fees, which currently is at 12,570, will be taken care of in one way, shape or form, either with grants uh, or scholarships. Um, so if they meet this condition, they don't have to worry about their, um, their tuition and fees as an undergrad. Um, but that doesn't mean they can get in addition, an additional amount beyond the 12,570. This is just the promise uh, that the UC system has to those uh, blue and gold students. Okay, so hopefully this example, it gives me an idea of um, a low income student that may be receiving financial aid and applied for, the, for financial aid. Um, in this scenario, there's a, a cost of attendance, as we talked about before, student living on campus, 33,270. Um, in this scenario, a current policy, the student would have received 23,570 in grant money, either through the Pell Grant, Cal Grant, or UC Grant, um, and also would have an um, opportunity to apply for a student loan or use work study that would total 9,700. So in this particular case, the student's uh, cost of attendance is covered, a combination of grants, loans, and work study. Now this is where the scholarship comes into play. So if a student is eligible for the Chancellor's Associate Scholarship Program of $10,000, which is for our partner schools, um, in, uh, renewable for a four-year period, um, you can see here that it eliminates the amount of loans and the work study in the financial aid award that we give a student. Um, so their total cost of attendance in this scenario of 33,270 is covered with um, grant aid and along with the CASP scholarship. So in this particular situation, the student uh, could end up or should end up graduating uh, without uh, any loan debt. Um, so important notes about eligibility um, for uh, the, the CASP, CASP scholarship. Um, so the important thing, as I mentioned before, is that you uh, properly uh, put your name, social security number uh, on your FAPSA or California Dream Act, because that's the way we connect information. Um, also um, residency, make sure you are considered a resident or uh, as Dr. Duda mentioned, the AB 540 eligible student, because um, the CASP is, is, we cannot award that for a, a non-resident student. Um, and appeal pending. So we do know that because of the COVID situation, um, the FAFSA may indicate a time where your parent, where the student's parents uh, made, a, were working and making additional funding. And for example, if they were at, um, let's say $85,000 of income, at that point, they would not be blue and gold eligible. But because of COVID, if they've lost their income or reduced their income because of COVID, lost their job, um, we will have an appeal process, which um, as um, Michelle Ojeda, our scholarship coordinator of CASP within the financial aid office, uh, will be uh, posting her uh, email address. So if you have any students, that are appealing their FAFSA information because of the lost income that will push them into CASP eligibility. Um, uh, she's the one to contact uh, the point person in our office um, uh, and she'll work with, with the families to, to work with that appeal to push them if eligible into CASP eligibility. Um, and then the final bullet here is just, there are some students that if they're not appealing and our have family incomes over 80,000. Um, in that case, unfortunately, they would not be eligible uh, for the CASP scholarship. 
And then I just wanted to uh, let, let you know of our website, uh, fas.ucsd.edu. Um, this is uh, at the bottom of the page. Um, I don't know if you can see it on, on the screen here or not, but that's where you'll see our contact information. The best way for, for you, the families to get in contact with us at this point in time is Zoom. Uh, so we have virtual counseling via Zoom. And it's worked out great that we may even continue that after COVID. Um, at the comfort of their own home, um, uh, students can uh, sign up for uh, an appointment via Zoom and talk with the counselor. And the counselor can show them uh, their screen, share their screen and show their um, whatever issue they may, may have and, and, and uh, counsel the student in that manner. Um, there's also a phone number. Um, we'll, we'll probably expand our phone number. Um, I'm going to expand our times answering phones as, as time goes on. Um, also, we do have in-person appointments as well. So at the very moment, I am in the office at UC San Diego, and we do take some um, in-person appointments for those that cannot be Zoom or uh, needed to talk in person uh, to a counselor. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, and like I said, the best way to contact our office will be via, uh, via Zoom. And uh, this is just a slide that indicates some um, websites where you can apply for scholarships. Um, if, for example, you, uh, a student is CAS eligible, um, unfortunately, we have to take that additional scholarship into account um, into their financial aid award package. But what we do is we try to ask the, the donor and ask them if they want to uh, uh, use it for the summertime. And if a student is interested in taking summertime units, um, then they can, uh, with the donor's permission, get some of their private uh, agency scholarships and use that for the, for the summertime period. Okay. And that's where I will go and stop. Okay. Thank you, Esteban. Um, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I will be, I will stick around 